At the height of their power in the Middle East, they controlled over a third of the nation of Syria and nearly half of the nation of Iraq. As the world watched, transfixed and powerless to stop it, the Islamic State rose from the carnage of the already devastating Syrian civil war. In the space of just a few seasons, the Islamic State went from near complete obscurity to becoming one of the most feared terrorist organizations that the world has ever seen. In the years since, the Islamic State has taken and held territory in multiple nations, committed atrocities, and amplified them through a keen awareness of social media and has since evolved into a multi-headed hydra with regional offshoots and cells that have taken root around the world. In today's installment of War of Graphics, we're going to explore the meteoric rise of the Islamic State in the mid-2010s, the global effort to put a stop to their reign of terror in Iraq and Syria, and the many insidious ways that the group has evolved into the worldwide parasite that it is today. Now, before we get into today's video, it's important to do a little bit of housekeeping on one issue that has been contentious since the Islamic State first emerged into public consciousness its name. The moniker that the West initially used for the group ISIS, meaning the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, was certainly catchy, but using it today somewhat misses the point. That organization once known as ISIS has since gone global. Similarly, the term ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, referring not just to Syria, but to areas like Jordan and Cyprus, was certainly more accurate back in 2013. But yet again, it doesn't capture what we now know to be the full scope of the group's presence or intent. Lastly, many countries around the world have used the term Daesh, an Arabic acronym, but this too came about when the group was mostly confined to Iraq and Syria. For the purposes of today's discussion, we're simply going to refer to them as Islamic State. And when we're referring to a national subgroup within the international Islamic State movement, uh, we'll be sure to let you know. Sound good? Well, good. With that out of the way, we can actually wind the clock back to 1999, when a Salafi jihadist militant from Jordan named Abu Musab al-Zakari founded a group called Jamaat al tawid wa al-Jihad. Their name translating to the organization of monotheism and jihad should make it pretty clear what they were all about. They liked monotheism, specifically Islam, and they liked jihad, which in its modern sense can be understood as an ideology that advocates the use of physical force by jihadist zealots against both Muslim and non-Muslim targets in order to spread an uncommonly violent interpretation of Islam known as Salafism. They used jihad to spread Salafism. They're Salafi jihadists. It makes sense. Now, back in these early days, Zakari and his organization wanted to use bombing tactics to start a sectarian war between Sunni and Shia Muslims. But when 2003's US-led Western coalition invaded Iraq, Zakari took advantage of the chaos. His group carried out suicide attacks on Shia targets, including mosques and civilians. And although the US military was aware of the group's broader goals, they were not treated as a priority by the West. Over the next few years, Zakwari and his organization found themselves in a delicate alliance with Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda and continued their attacks on civilians, Iraqi forces, and coalition members alike, including in a brazen 2005 bombing of a hotel in Jordan where civilians made up the vast majority of the casualties. Zakwari would pay for those attacks with his own life in an airstrike by the US, and following his death in 2006, the group changed their mission. Gathering up support from a number of small factions in Iraq, they formed the so-called Mutayyabin Coalition. Coalition. And on October the 13th, 2006, they declared to the world that they'd founded the Islamic State of Iraq, or ISI. The group immediately set to work accumulating their power by infiltrating regional governments in several Iraqi provinces. The following few years were difficult for the emerging Islamic State, who at that time were referred to by the West as Al-Qaeda in Iraq. They faced significant resistance from their fellow Sunni Arab Iraqis, leading to the group's numbers in significance being severely beaten down, and their leaders were prime targets for airstrikes and raids. But when one of those raids killed the group's two top leaders in 2010, they left a power vacuum behind where one truly despicable man filled the void. His name? Abu Bakir al-Baghdadi, a violent fundamentalist who in just a few years' time would become one of the most notorious outlaws in the entire world. With Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's entrance came a number of strategic changes for the nascent Islamic State. Baghdadi recruited new leaders from a pool of disillusioned former intelligence and military officers. These were men who had lost their place in the government after the fall of Saddam Hussein and had spent time imprisoned in US camps in the intervening years. Already embittered against the Iraq 
hierarchy state, with many of them entrenched in fundamentalist ideals, they were an ideal target for the Islamic State's radical message. Within about two years, this new cadre of leaders had helped the Islamic State rebuild its ranks, and the group escalated its campaign against the Iraqi state and the Western coalition. Car bombings became more and more frequent. The fatality count in Iraq, which had for years resembled that of a low-grade insurgency, started ratcheting up again. And though Baghdadi and his officers might not have known it at first, they were timing their expansion perfectly to coincide with a far larger shift in the Middle East. In March of 2011, large-scale protests broke out in Syria against the regime of Bashar al-Assad, and in the following months, those protests turned to nationwide demonstrations, and then open rebellion, and then finally a full-scale revolt. In general, with Salafi jihadist movements, the outbreak of civil war nearby is viewed as a good opportunity to start some sh and the Islamic State quickly set out to make the situation in Syria as awful as they could. Detachments of Islamic State fighters began to cross the border into Syria and coalesce under the name Jabhat al-Nusra Li Ali Asham, or as the Western media dubbed them, the al-Nusra Front. But rather than try and bring down the Assad regime outright, or immediately go into battle with the Free Syrian Army for control of the opposition, al-Nusra decided to bide their time and lay the preparations for a much larger assault. They started setting up shop in majority Sunni areas, which would later become flashpoints in the Islamic State's war against the West. This happened in Aleppo Governorate, Syria's most populous province, as well as the governance of Raqqa and Deir Azor. The group's radical message was a hit, with many young, disenfranchised Syrians who saw al-Nusra Front as one of the most brutal, hardline ways to take a stand against the Assad regime. And when those young recruits learned what the larger Islamic State movement was really all about, many of their number decided not to turn away. So, before we reach the moment that the Islamic State went supernova, Let's take a moment and discuss the movement's core beliefs, shall we? Above all else, the Islamic State wants to establish a caliphate, a nation-state governed under the principles of Islamic law, better known as Sharia law. In the case of Salafi jihadists, this, of course, has to do with their interpretation of Sharia law, which isn't representative of most interpretations around the world. The Islamic State takes a much more radically fundamentalist view of Sharia than most groups, and mandates that people inside their caliphate adhere to codes and laws that they believe emulates the lifestyle of the Prophet Muhammad himself, as well as his early followers. What this looks like, in practice, is a long list of strict codes governing every aspect of life, from a person's dress to their behaviors to outlawed goods and pastimes like music and modern technology. The Islamic State's ideology orients the lives of any people living under their caliphate toward what the Islamic State's religious leaders believe is a life in service to God, and according to them, all Sunni Muslims are, by default, members of that same caliphate. Shia Muslims are apostates, believers in another faith are apostates, believers in no faith are apostates, and the punishment that the Islamic State wants to hand out, either for refusal to follow Salafi Islam or for violating the caliphate's codes, are meant to be incredibly brutal. These include public floggings and beatings, amputation of limbs for what most people in the West would consider minor offenses, as well as executions, often by such brutal methods as beheading or immolation. In April of 2013, the world began to see firsthand what it meant to live under this sort of caliphate. With his forces built up enough to be able to stand against most opposition, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi directed his troops in Syria to rapidly expand and begin taking territory. On April the 8th, al-Baghdadi released an audio statement to the world in which he announced that al-Qaeda in Iraq and al-Nusra Front were merging together and becoming the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham, with al-Sham meaning Syria and the surrounding region. The announcement faced backlash from the quasi-independent leader of al-Nusra as well as the global leader of al-Qaeda at the time, Ayman al-Sahari. But both of their protests fell on deaf ears. Islamic State fighters seized the initiative, raiding Taji prison and the notorious Abu Ghraib prison in July of that year, and recruiting massive numbers of very angry, very violent prisoners. The change wasn't easy. And it wasn't seamless. Many holdouts within al-Nusra front tried to distance themselves from the new caliphate. But it wouldn't matter. The Islamic State was far more ruthless than al-Nusra in achieving their shared goals, and, as we are about to see, the Islamic State's rapid expansion made it a beacon for the most hardline, most violent fundamentalists around the world. And it's here that we get into one of the reasons that the Islamic State became as fearsome as it did. Its fluency with social media, which it used to spread its message in some truly unprecedented ways. The Islamic State 
was not the first terrorist organization to try and propagate itself online, but it was the first to be effective at large scales. In February of 2015, a former National Security Council official stated that over 90,000 pro-Islamic state messages were being posted on social media per day at that time, and subsequent analyses of that claim found that the true number might actually be twice as high. These messages were spread on Twitter, on Facebook, and elsewhere, with various Islamic State accounts either spreading propaganda, posting pictures or videos of the war in Iraq and Syria, or of people the Islamic State had killed, or trying to make contact with potential recruits around the world. The group produced slick, action-packed, Hollywood-style videos with translations into many European languages and worked hard to create content that, on its face, seemed approachable for a Western onlooker. And by all accounts, this strategy absolutely worked. Thousands upon thousands of Westerners, many who had no prior affiliation with jihadist ideology or even with Islam, were taken in by the Islamic State's message, reaching out and making connections to shadowy recruiters in some of the internet's darkest corners. Some took the leap because they were after a sense of identity or belonging or even camaraderie. Others, especially new converts to Islam, were convinced that coming to the Islamic State was a religious obligation. The group made a specific effort to convert and lure in adolescent girls from Europe and the United States, many of whom made global news as so-called ISIS brides. And from the Middle East, Northern Africa, and South Asia, the Islamic State attracted even more recruits. By December 2015, the American National Bureau of Economic Research estimated that the Islamic State had some 30,000 foreign fighters within its ranks, with the citizens of wealthier nations being more likely, not less likely, to travel to Syria or Iraq and take up arms. As the Islamic State recruiters kicked into overdrive, so too did its military offensive. First, they locked down a zone in eastern Syria around the city of Raqqa, where they had been poised to strike for months before finally taking the opportunity. Almost immediately, they began to implement their version of Sharia law in the areas they controlled, publicizing what they considered to be their successors in order to entice more and more global recruits to take the leap and come to Syria. From there, they began to seize infrastructure in the east, most prominently oil fields and refineries, which gave the Islamic State nearly free reign to start selling oil on the black market. With oil sales and donations from foreigners came more revenue, and with more revenue came more, better, and heavier weapons. Islamic State troops were fighting disorganized, scattered troops from a range of opposing groups. The Syrian government, sure, but also Syrian pro-democracy rebels, other Islamists, and the Iraqi government too. But because these groups lacked any level of coordination against the Islamic State, they were unprepared to cope with the asymmetric attacks that came their way. Often, the Islamic State would capture a town or village with just a few hundred or even just a few dozen fighters rolling in on pickup trucks in savage, blitzkrieg-style attacks at small scale. Usually, if a defending force was beaten, there would not be enough reinforcements in the area to take back a town before Islamic State troops dug themselves in and built a strong local militia. In the event that a counterattack did come, the Islamic State's forces were so light and mobile that they'd often be gone before the counterattack even arrived. These sorts of tactics, in such a fractious environment, allowed the Islamic State to do more with less, taking and holding territory with far fewer troops than many Western military analysts would have thought possible. From their stronghold in eastern Syria, the Islamic State expanded outward rapidly. In Iraq, they co-opted protests in the cities of Fallujah and Ramadi, aiding local militias, but then taking control of those cities themselves. Islamic State militants killed 670 Shia prisoners at a prison near Mosul and slaughtered over 1,500 unarmed Shia cadets of the Iraqi Air Force in a military camp near Tikrit. Seizing on the positive propaganda and rallying support from Sunni Muslims in Iraq, the Islamic State drove toward the city of Mosul, where some 30,000 Iraqi troops and another 30,000 federal police were ostensibly dug in and ready to repel the advance of somewhere between 8 and 1500 Islamic State militants. Attacking with a force that might have been outnumbered up to 30 to 1, invading a city where, if you've watched our Art of War installment on urban warfare, they should have expected to be dealt with quickly, the Islamic State instead overran the Iraqi army's checkpoints with convoys of pickup trucks. Defenders at the checkpoints were hanged, burned alive even crucified, with word of the Islamic State's savagery quickly spreading to the rest of the defenders. Despite attempts to attack the militants with helicopters, the Islamic State fighters instead melted away into the city, establishing sleeper cells and waiting for a few days until a second force, a convoy of about 100 Islamic State vehicles, attacked the city. When they did, the jihadists already inside the city rose up, decapitating Mosul's military and police leadership with bombings and targeted assassinations, and leaving Iraqi forces basically leaderless. Within two 
days. Most of the Iraqi defenders had either run or been killed, many of them abandoning their weapons and trying to escape dressed as civilians. The entire assault had taken no more than a week, and it left the entire city of Mosul and its outskirts under the Islamic State's control while sending a shocking global message about just how powerless the Iraqi government was to stop them. With the fall of Mosul and other territory came equipment that the Islamic State looted, stole, or forced Western-backed Iraqi troops to abandon. This included Soviet-era tanks, US-made Humvees, and Black Hawk helicopters, advanced small arms, even fighter jets. Although the Islamic State didn't have the ability to use some of these weapons or even hide them from enemy bombardment, they could use the guns and tanks just fine, and black market weapons flooded into the area as well. After Mosul fell, the Islamic State declared its official caliphate on the territory it occupied with Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi as caliph. Despite strong opposition from global Muslims, the Islamic State claimed that it was the sole leader of Islam around the world, and they set to work trying to prove that claim in the ways they ran their captured territory. The Islamic State began a transition to bureaucratic rule, instituting government functions like tax collection, healthcare, and policing in ways that the group deemed adherent to Sharia principles. With those public services came the Islamic State's extreme violence. Public executions and amputations became commonplace, with the dead displayed as a warning to others in their city. The Islamic State embarked on a campaign of ruthless sexual violence against the women in its territory, forcing many of them into marriages or sexual slavery with little regard for whether they were targeting women or children. And all of this was rewarded in the Islamic State's eyes by the early signs of viability within their caliphate. By late 2014, the Islamic State ruled over 11 million people across 100,000 square kilometers and controlled some $2 billion in assets, including between $1 and $2 million of oil revenue per day. In August and September of 2014, as they reached the height of their power, the Islamic State started to intentionally provoke more and more of the world's major powers, beheading Western journalists and holding their diplomats or everyday citizens hostage for ransom. They destroyed global cultural sites, including the ancient city of Palmyra in Syria and the Mosque of the Prophet Jonah in Iraq. In February 2015, video of a Jordanian military pilot being burned alive by the Islamic State appeared to be the final straw, and a US-led global coalition, which had already been helping to defend Kurdish areas in northern Syria from the Islamic State's advance, now began to set its sights on bringing down the so-called caliphate entirely. By now, we imagine that anyone watching this video might have one big glaring question about the Islamic State's actions in Iraq and Syria. Did they really think that after killing international, even Western victims, taking over major cities and committing countless crimes against humanity, that the rest of the world was just gonna let it happen? Surely, even such a twisted, depraved movement must have been able to understand that such intense, continual brutality would have demanded a response. In reality, though, the Islamic State wasn't just aware that that sort of response was coming, they were planning on it. In addition to everything else that the Islamic State had become, they were also a death cult, a group whose leaders and propagandists were obsessed with their notion of a coming apocalypse. As the Islamic State's religious leaders saw it, a massive part of their mission was to prepare for a series of cataclysmic final battles with the non-believers of the world. If you remember the early leader whose Al-Qaeda in Iraq group eventually became the Islamic State, Abu Musab al-Zakrari, he believed that the US invasion of Iraq in 2003 had set off a countdown to the end times, as evidenced by what he perceived as an alliance between Shia Muslims and the other religions of the world in order to wipe out Sunni Islam. Zakwari's successors turned that same apocalypse mythology into a major recruiting tool, constructing a narrative that their final battle with the West would take place in the modest, militarily insignificant Syrian town of Dabiq. There, many in the Islamic State seemed to genuinely believe that the caliphate was destined to triumph and become a reborn global empire, practicing the same super-extreme perversion of Islam that the pre-apocalypse Islamic State had been. Now, stepping back from the loony pin for just a second, it shouldn't be too hard to see a couple of problems with this theory. In reality, the Islamic State had no hope of surviving against an international coalition that was bent on wiping it out, and acting like the end times were coming had gotten the world's guns trained on the Islamic State. Uh, like they were in a John Wick poster. But Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, believe it or not, was no John Wick. And when the big guns of the West came calling, 
The Islamic State began to suffer some serious consequences for its actions. First, there were the attacks from the sky with Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and a number of other countries coordinating airstrikes against Islamic State targets in both Iraq and Syria. These airstrikes were able to destroy a large portion of the Islamic State's heavy equipment reserves, as well as hard targets like dug-in defensive positions, militant camps, and administrative facilities. Although Russia's own attempt at an air offensive mostly co-opted the situation in order to attack other anti-Assad rebels, Russia nonetheless did conduct significant strikes of its own against Islamic State targets. Then there were the ground attacks, oriented most effectively behind Kurdish forces in Iraq and Syria's northern regions, but also relying on Iraqi government forces and anti-government, anti-Islamic State militias in Syria. As we've already discussed, the Islamic State successes were, in large part, because they had been able to exploit disorganized and warring factions in Syria and deal with Iraqi soldiers who were, to put it kindly, not ready to face such a fearsome enemy. But the same small forces that had been so effective in taking territory were now going to have a very hard time holding it when they were faced with much larger and much more prepared attacking armies. It's the same problem that guerrilla-style resistances have faced around the world for centuries, and when the Islamic State made the same error, it effectively condemned many of its fighters to death. During 2014 and 2015, the Islamic State came under siege from all sides. Kurdish troops pushing in from the north, Syrian resistance troops and the Assad regime from the south and east, and the Iraqi military from the west, all backed by a coalition air force that had complete control of the sky. First, it lost many of its oil fields, bombarded and set a fire to keep the Islamic State from continuing to make money. Then in 2016, the city of Ramadi fell to the anti-Islamic State coalition, followed shortly by Fallujah. Iraqi Shia militias began to rise up and organize themselves into watchdog groups, ensuring that liberated territories didn't fall back under the group's sway when coalition forces left. In Syria, the Islamic State was cut off from the Turkish border and beaten back quickly from many of its territories. That's not to say that the Islamic State went down quietly. The group's fighters were incredibly fierce and tenacious in trying to hold their ground, often willing to sacrifice civilians at random in order to preserve a town here or a village there. Many of them relied on amphetamines to fight without fear of death and were more than willing to sacrifice themselves using suicide vests, truck bombs, or desperate bloody last stands, often well past the time that the places they were guarding lost their strategic significance. Nowhere was this resistance more devastating than in the liberation of Mosul, where a few thousand Islamic State fighters, no more than 12,000 at their peak, forced over 100,000 coalition troops to fight for over nine months before being defeated. The city was booby-trapped and mined to hell, with Islamic State forces dug in inside countless defensive positions, and while the Western-backed coalition was eventually able to clear the city piece by piece, the Islamic State unleashed chlorine and mustard gas in order to inflict as much pain as possible. Thousands of civilians were caught in the crossfire, along with many Iraqi and Kurdish Peshmerga troops. During the nine months that Mosul spent under siege during heated battle, the coalition was also focused on Raqqa, the center of the Islamic State's early caliphate. In an offensive that lasted nearly a year, coalition troops isolated Raqqa from its surrounding communities and highways, then moved in and spent some three months battling for control. By now, the citizens of Raqqa were well and truly terrified of their Islamic State captors, and the Islamic State itself lacked many of its better fighters who had been pinned down in Mosul or forced to scatter elsewhere. Nonetheless, the ones who remained turned the battle into a grueling house-to-house -house affair, one where pockets of Islamic State militants would hold out inside small neighborhoods and make their best attempts to butcher anyone who dared enter. For many foreign fighters who had sacrificed everything to join the Islamic State when it had been making early gains from Raqqa, that city was now going to be the site of their last stand. They were whittled down, piece by piece, eventually running out of food, ammunition, and fresh water. But rather than surrendering, they turned to suicide attacks and attempts at hand-to-hand -hand combat. When small cells were cornered, they consistently used every bit of force and munitions left at their disposal, relying on their enemies' awareness of just how well fortified and booby-trapped their defensive positions were. In many cases, one surviving Islamic State fighter meant that an entire building would have to be taken, and the militants used dugout hidden tunnels and civilian disguises to attack the coalition in their back lines. Perhaps not wanting to risk their martyrdom going off script, the most hardline Islamic State fighters allowed their brothers in arms to negotiate a ceasefire with hundreds of fighters and their families allowed to flee the city in a convoy. Once they were gone, the remaining jihadists and the coalition ground each other down until the last Islamic State foothold, a sports stadium, was finally cleared months after the battle had begun. 
According to a UN estimate, 80% of the city had been rendered uninhabitable, and the Islamic State's mass graves would be discovered for years to come. The fall of Raqqa represented the elimination of the Islamic State's final major strongholds, and in the months that followed, the group would be rooted out of villages, have their oil fields captured, and experienced a slow, progressive whittling down of what remained. In November 2017, both Syria and Iraq declared victory over the Islamic State. During 2018, they would be cleared out of their remaining small holdings as their sleeper cells were exposed and their contacts in the region's major cities were identified. In March of 2019, the village of Al Bakuz, the last of the Islamic State's territorial holdings, was finally eliminated, and half a year later, in October 2019, the group's leader, Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, killed himself as US forces closed in on his position in Syria. As of now, the group's scattered bands of fighters can only lay territorial claim to small pockets of mostly empty desert in Iraq and Syria, always ready to leave town in advance of local forces that they can no longer hope to oppose. But even before the Islamic State was toppled in Iraq and Syria, it was already working hard to ensure that any future loss of its territory wouldn't be the end of the group's mission. In 2015, the Islamic State began to establish what it termed Wiliat provinces around the world, sowing the seeds of resistance in a number of global hot zones. They also began building terrorist cells in Western nations and started to work more diplomatically with other Islamist organizations, eventually getting several to declare their direct allegiance to the Caliphate. First, there's the many global insurgencies that have chosen to ally themselves with Islamic State, either to capitalize on the group's notoriety as a recruiting tool or to align with a brand of jihadism that they'd already been preaching, but called another name. One particularly fearsome jihadi group, Nigeria's Boko Haram insurgency, had already spent over a decade waging war across the Lake Chad Basin, but shortly after they gained worldwide attention for kidnapping several hundred girls from a school and taking them hostage, Boko Haram chose to swear allegiance to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. They rebranded themselves as the Islamic State of West Africa, and although the group has gone through growing pains and splintering, the ISWA organization now claims thousands of fighters and keeps a tight hold on local communities. In July of 2014, a group in the Philippines, Abu Sayyaf, tried a similar tactic, swearing allegiance to the Islamic State, carrying out bombings and kidnappings and catching the ire of the Philippines' now former strongman, Rodrigo Duarte. Abu Sayyaf began to use its vantage point to export the Islamic State's message to Indonesia and South Thailand, propagating the ideology there as well. And in Egypt, the group Ansar Bayat al Makdis eventually splintered and gave rise to Islamic State movements in Gaza and Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. Today, Islamic State offshoots exist in Afghanistan, Tunisia, Algeria, Uzbekistan, Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, and the North Caucasus region of Russia, with a wide range of other groups professing their own varying levels of support for the cause. In 2015, amidst a raging civil war in Libya, an Islamic State offshoot was able to secure 150 miles of coastline before eventually being pushed out. Then there's the Islamic State's long history of terror attacks around the world, not just in the West, but against any target that the group perceived to act or believe in opposition to its mission. Sometimes these were directed attacks carried out by Islamic State sleeper cells. At other times, they were carried out by lone wolf attackers expressing their allegiance to the Islamic State's broader cause. In November 2015, two suicide bombers attacked a neighborhood in Beirut and killed 40 people. The following day, eight Islamic State gunmen attacked Paris in a series of coordinated attacks that took the lives of 130 people. That same month, a Russian passenger jet was bombed by the Islamic State while mid-air killing 224 people, and in March of 2016, they bombed Brussels Airport in Belgium, killing 32 more. They killed 142 in a mosque in Yemen, 38 at a hotel in Tunisia, 109 at a peace rally in Turkey, 60 at a police training camp in Libya, and 86 at a Bastille Day celebration in Nice, France. The group committed numerous attacks in Afghanistan, including a bombing in Kabul in 2016 that killed 80, another at a voting registration site that killed 69, another at a wedding that killed 92, and a suicide bombing at Hamid Karzai National Airport, killing 183 in a tightly packed crowd during the U.S. evacuation from Afghanistan in 2021. In low wolf attacks, a married couple slaughtered 14 people in San Bernardino, California. In the following year, Omar Mateen opened fire at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, killing 49. This long list is just a tiny fraction 
of the overall number of attacks, which saw thousands of people killed in the Islamic State's name around the world. And finally, it's important to discuss the lingering presence of Islamic State sympathizers in refugee camps in Iraq and Syria, where many families were taken after the deaths of the adult male militants who had previously been their providers. In these camps, most famously the al hor camp in Hasaka in Syria, many refugees live under a continued reign of terror perpetrated by so-called ISIS wives, women who have organized religious police groups that teach Islamic State ideology to the thousands of children living there and have even orchestrated the murders of aid workers or anti-Islamic State refugees within the camps. Many of these women have renounced their citizenship in their home countries, and thousands upon thousands of these children have been issued only Islamic State birth certificates without being counted by the Syrian or Iraqi governments that they should technically live under. Many worry that confining these families to the squalor and chaos of refugee camps doesn't just prolong the presence of the Islamic State in the region, but might inflame it for decades to come, as these people turn to that same radical ideology to express their rage against the very real suffering that they are experiencing in these camps. When taken together, all of these factors point to an Islamic State movement that has, thankfully, been beaten down past the point they would ever be able to hold territory again. But it's not gone. And in light of recent attacks like a prison break on Kurdish territory in 2022 and a growing turn to guerrilla-style insurgency and assassination, it's simply not accurate to say that the Islamic State has ceased to be a threat. Certainly the organization learns the hard lesson that it has no real hope of holding enough territory to call it a caliphate, and there's no indication that that reality will ever change. Certainly, it's not going to change anytime soon, but the Islamic State's influence is very much alive in some of the darkest corners of the world, and its brutal, parasitic ideology is likely to remain alive for years, or even decades to come.